You're listening to the ONP Check-In, an SPS podcast. This podcast brings you the latest happenings in the ONP industry. We're unpacking trends and news from this tight-knit orthotics and prosthetics community. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jackie Green. I'm a marketing specialist at SPS. And I'm Brendan Erickson, regional sales manager here at SPS. Welcome back to our listeners. If you're new to the ONP Check-In, here is what you can expect. In each episode, we provide a quick SPS update and discuss hot topics in O&P with leading professionals in the industry. Before we get started, let's hear a word from our sponsor. Knit-right soft sock prosthetic socks stretch and recover to conform to the limb, making them comfortable next to the skin and shrinkage resistant. They are made with moisture wicking fibers to keep the wearer dry and inhibit odor in the sock. Knit Right Soft Socks are sold individually or as a multi-pack, which can provide a complete starter pack for new patients in a variety of plies. Explore Knit Right Soft Socks on the SPS online store at spsco.com. So Brendan, what's happening over at SPS? Well, there's a ton always, always happening, but we've got some really cool, exciting news about some live events coming across the nation to key cities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more about those? In the month of May, we're coming to Spokane, Washington, Aberdeen, Maryland, and down to Mobile, Alabama. Ooh, a little bit of everywhere. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, so what are we calling them, Jackie? So it's the SPS Clinical Education Day, and it is a live event featuring a range of topics from upper extremity prosthetic devices to lower extremity orthotic solutions, fabrication techniques, socket technology, and a lot more. That's awesome. So give me some highlights. Why should our listeners register, and what are they going to receive if they do? All right, so you're going to get up to 9.5 available credit hours in the scientific category. We are also going to have a complimentary breakfast and lunch. So free food, just saying. Hey, who said there was never a free lunch? (laughs) Networking with SPS sales account manager and fellow O&P professionals, obviously, as well. And then this is just a great opportunity to deepen your knowledge on a wide range of different devices and techniques. Well, that's awesome. I think that's kind of a fun event for everybody to get together. Maybe um, maybe some colleagues you haven't seen since you were in OMP school, things like that. We're going to have some other live events across the nation, uh, one in Anaheim uh, out in California, another one at our, our flagship headquarters in Alpharetta, Georgia. Um, so if you follow the link in our show notes, you can register for those events today. Okay, everybody, our guest today comes to us from the University of Texas at Dallas, and I am pleased to welcome Professor of Computer Science, Dr. Bala Krishnan Prabha Karan. So he also serves as a program director of the National Science Foundation through the Intergovernmental Personal Act. He has many notable accolades, including the prestigious NSF Career Award for his proposal of animated databases. So welcome, and we are so glad to have you on the show to talk about the impact of virtual reality on phantom limb pain. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, It's my pleasure to be here, and thank you, Brendan, and thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, we are very excited to talk about this topic today. So (laughs) let's dive in. So could you explain what set you off on this path to studying the treatment of phantom limb pain and using virtual reality? And maybe give a little bit of your background leading into that as well. So our our listeners can understand. Okay, you are asking a professor to give a background, then it would be a lecture for an hour or an hour and a half. Right? <laughs> do it, do it. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> you got students listening. I'm just kidding. Um, I've been working with uh, my colleagues in physical medicine and rehabilitation for nearly two decades now. And we have been working on different aspects of using technology for gait analysis, stroke, um, you know, patients rehabilitation. Um, so... He, um, it's a he, the collaborator is a he, and he invited me to um, give a short course, medical course with him in a medical conference. So that I went and you can guess where it is, where it was. It was in Las Vegas. So I couldn't say no to that. And we, um, we had this course and I, they had a lot of other presentations as well. And I was going through those presentations and I could see that the phantom pain was still an unaddressed problem for 
many people and people were trying to come up with some uh, technologies that I felt that it was not really easy for people to use. And at that point in time on the technology side, we were at an advanced stage where we could capture 3D of you or Brandon as a human. You know, it did have the color of the T-shirt, color of the, I mean, you know, head for everything and put you in a virtual reality space. We had that technology and it was easy to, to manipulate in terms of the, the human model as an avatar. And so I was talking to my students, hey, I think we can do much better than these folks who are doing it. And, you know, why don't you replicate the missing limb and then we put them on the mixed reality platform that we have. I mean, it's not easy. You know, there's a lot of math that goes behind replication because, you know, we don't have that information. But I had a very good student. It's a she and she said yes. And she did it in, you know, a few months. And um, but then the challenge was that what do you do now? Right. So we replicated the limb. But what would the participants do? What would the amputee do? And and then we looked at how they were, you know, handling it in uh, for existing patients, and they were like doing some rudimentary activities. And I talked to my colleague, and he said that the key thing is to do longitudinally for several weeks, and preferably at home. I was like, this is going to be boring if you just put them in mixed reality. And say, hey, we have your missing limb here. Look at it. That's not going to be anything fun for them. So so. We started working on developing some games that they can play with that missing limb. That's kind of like created illusionary missing limb in the mixed reality. So the the thing was like you, um, when I say you, the patient would use the the existing limb and move, and then we will use the illusion of the mirrored limb to make those movements, and we had several games, like three or four games, like playing a piano or, you know, um, bursting some bubbles and things like that. So so this is how we came to doing it, like a, a, like a suite of games. And we call it mixed reality. And if you are interested, I would explain what's the difference between virtual reality and mixed reality um, and called it Mr. Map. And we did some clinical trials and we are still working on it. Can you explain what the difference is between those two? Because I don't, I don't know what the difference is. Yeah, so you can look at it like a continuum. On, on one side, it's reality, the physical environment that you see, right? On the other side, the other end of the spectrum is virtual reality, where everything is virtual. It's make-believe, right? So how do you make believe? You put on a head-mounted display, shut the person off from the reality, and then put them in the total virtual environment. So that's the other end of the spectrum. So there is, it's a continuous spectrum over here. So we can have augmented reality where you see the reality, but you know you can provide some information like HoloLens or other other devices that can say, "Oh, that's a tree, that's a car that you are watching," and things like that. That's called augmented reality. And mixed reality is more towards the virtual, but you are still in the physical world. So, the, you know, you are still the human. You see yourself like in a mirror. So that's the physical side of thing, the, the real side of thing, right? And, and then you see yourself in a virtual world playing those games. So that's why it's called mixed reality. So that is a, whatever you do in the physical world, you can see yourself doing it in the virtual world. And it's not through an avatar, which would be like a game, right? Or a virtual reality game would be through an avatar, um, which is very different looking from whatever you would be looking, right? So it's not creating that kind of an immersive feeling, hey, I got that limb back, right? If, if you see it on an avatar, whereas you see it on yourself on a mirror, which is a virtual mirror, and you see that, hey, I'm wearing black shirt today and, you know, you can't see my pants, but gray pants today. And I see my limb exactly like how it would be in the real world, right? So that is going to rewire my brain. And that would, if you are interested, I would explain why the phantom pain occurs. 
And then that can help you understand why this mirroring is important. So what exactly triggers that in a brain? Yeah, if you look at the term, it's called phantom pain. So it's not real pain. The, the amputation has happened. The wound has healed. So there is no real pain for the person. So what is causing that pain? It's something that the brain visualizes. So what is the brain visualizing? The brain is thinking that the limb is still intact because it's so used to seeing the limb for years and weeks and days, right? Now, when the person gets amputated, the brain is still sending signals to that limb. You know, move your leg, move your arm, do the, because you know, when you do any gestures, some signal gets sent to both the limbs. Now, what is happening in the brain typically is that it wants a visual confirmation. So when you have your limbs intact, there is a visual confirmation that occurs in the back of the brain. We are not aware of it. But, you know, I'm looking at my hand and brain is telling my hand is moving. And visually, the brain is confirming that the hand is moving, right? Now, this visual confirmation happens automatically. And now that is missing when the person gets amputated. Now, the brain is saying, hey, I am telling the limb to move. The limb is not moving. That is some problem. You attend to it. Okay. So that's why it's a conflict. It's a conflict between visual confirmation and the physical movement that is ordered by the brain. And now that conflict is telling the brain there is some pain. That's brain's way of getting your attention, right? Pain is just a mechanism for the body to draw your attention. You know, something is wrong, attend to it. Now the brain is telling you, hey, something is wrong with your limb, attend to it. But there's nothing wrong. So what do the person do? Goes to the doctor, the doctor prescribes pain medication to, to tell the brain, to numb the brain down, right? That there's no pain. But that's kind of like an addictive way of going things, right? Going towards handling that pain. So I have a follow-up question there and tell me if I'm completely thinking about this wrong, but a disconnect occurs and um, the brain sensors fire pain for you to, I guess, realize that, right? And brain ever use other receptors, like it would ever use something else other than pain or is it always pain because it's sensing something wrong? It's typically, uh, th- th- I'm, 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 again, I'm not a medical expert, right, or a, or a pain expert. If you, even if you look at medical ex- medical experts, you know, they are looking at nose separately, ears separately. <laughs> so the pain experts are different, right? I mean, they, they have a whole branch of medicine in pain, handling pain, right? So um, the way I understand is pain is a mechanism that the brain uses to draw your attention. And so it's not... The way I would say is not something that you receive, but it's more that the brain sends to you to alert you to your conscious part of it, saying that, hey, you know, imagine that something hard touches your skin on your hand, right? Now, you feel a pain because the brain tells you, attend to it, remove that hard object, otherwise it's going to harm your body, right? So, so, so actually, um, the granularity of phantom pain when I say granularity, it could be whole limb, it could be part of the limb. And in fact, I had one of my you know, grad school days friends who had an accident and had to remove his toe, big toe in the foot. And you know, he was telling me that you know, I, I feel tingling sensation, I feel pain in the toe. And I was like, but your wound has healed. And, you know, because I was naive at that, I mean, I didn't know about it. And, you know, wound has healed. And he said, no, I don't know why, but it's still, I still feel the pain. I still feel the sensation. So the granularity of that missing thing could be anything. It could be the whole limb. It could be partial limb. It could be even a toe. But, but it's very difficult to handle small missing parts in the, in the technology that we have. So we address it for the whole limb, typically. Well, so you already mentioned Mr. Map. Um, let's dive into that because last year you conducted a pilot trial of this. Um, what is Mr. Map? Is Map an acronym? Um, how does it help patients struggling with phantom limb pain? Wonderful. So that's one reason why I try to explain the difference between mixed reality and virtual reality because Mr. Mr. Map stands for mixed reality based management of 
phantom pain. And it, as the term says, right, it uses mixed reality where people has this continuum of real world and the virtual world. It is a, a modern technology-based rendering of mirror therapy, which was found to be very helpful. And the traditional box mirror therapy or mirror box therapy, as it is called, um, was found to be useful to, to correct that visual motor discrepancy that I talked about for the brain. Right, And I can dwell a little bit more into that mirror box therapy if you are interested to, to explain how this Mr. Map is you know, doing something very similar, but at the same time overcoming the limitations of the, the mirror box therapy. Yeah, please expand on it. So mirror box therapy, again, as the name stands, right, you can imagine a box with a mirror, which is physical, right? And... Um, what does a mirror do? It reflects, right? So, it you know you can reflect your intact limb using a mirror, and now you can align the position of the patient and the mirror so that the patient can see the missing limb being mirrored using the intact limb, right? But now it's a physical mirror, and mirror is kind of like you know um, fragile and things like that. So you you cannot ask the patient to do different type of action. So it's very restricted in that sense. And also, now the other thing is, if you remember, um, you know, my collaborator told me that you need to have a longitudinal intervention to make the brain believe that things are okay, right? How do you do this longitudinal thing? You have to do it at home for several weeks. Now, installing this mirror and asking you know the the amputee to do some things in front of the mirror precisely aligning himself or herself with the mirror that is going to be a tough thing you can do it in a clinic and but in a clinic you can do it for five minutes ten minutes maybe once a week it's not really helping the patient right but remember even that 15 20 minutes in clinic was found to be more helpful for the patients right so the the advantage of mixed reality based thing is like we are using off the shelf or commodity hardware which are used by gamers right head mounted displays and laptops to create this illusion of missing limb and asking them to play a game now the idea of playing a game is to two things one is to tell the brain that you can still use your missing limb kind of cheating the brain right tricking the brain now the other thing is that if you are going to simply ask the patient to say, hey, we can recreate the limb, come watch it, then it's not that engaging. It's boring, right? Maybe the person will do it once a week, right? And it's not going to help. So the idea of having a game-based system is to make them play it for like 15 minutes morning, 15 minutes evening, or 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes in the evening and do it like three weeks or four weeks. And then hopefully, you know, they can feel uh, relief in that pain. Wow, I, that's pretty awesome. And and I could see in a mirror box it being very difficult. Say you're a lower limb, um, you have lower limb loss, you probably then have to sit down, correct? And just be restricted to some movements sitting down with the mirror in between your legs. But I bet virtual, it's like limitless, right? You are right on spot, Brendan. So um, the w mirror box therapy was primarily tried with um, upper limb amputees because it's more convenient. If you're a lower limb amputee and say all of us were watching that amputee in the virtual reality world, wearing the headset and things, are they restricted to sitting down and um, not wearing a prosthesis at the time? Or could they be in you know, three-dimensional space wearing their prosthetic limb, yet they're visualizing their own limb and and they're doing activities on the prosthetic but then i guess virtually realizing that that prosthetic is their own limb does that make sense yeah yeah nbc nbc5 dallas i mean i think it was local nbc5 dallas had a an interview in my lab with the veteran and dallas morning news had an interview with the veteran as well and both of them had some uh, videos that go with it. The reason I'm talking about the video is the veteran had uh, prosthesis, a prosthetic limb, um, and because of the accident. And I think he demonstrated it with 
uh, the prosthetic limb. But it's interesting that he said, one thing he said is that instead of wearing a, a pants that cover the prosthetic limb, if he can remove that and then do it. And, you know, he found it to be a more believable and more uh, useful. So I think it's, it's more about um, the brain, how it visualizes it, because from the technology point of view, we will remove the prosthetic limb anyway. I mean, so you understand how it works, right? We, we, because some of them may have partial limbs still intact. And so, but what, that's why I said the granularity of the, the amputation, right? So what we do is to remove the whole virtually, right? <laughs> and I say remove, not, not like a doctor removing it, but in the technology, in the avatar, we would remove the stump of the existing limb and then mirror the illusion of the intact limb on the other side. So, you know, the prosthetic limb will be removed and then the intact limb will be mirrored no matter what, right? And now coming to the answer, coming to the, your question of do they sit down or move, right? That's more of a safety issue, right? So it, because, you know, if you're asking them to do some tasks that are exercising their knees and ankle, uh, and we are asking them move one foot and do it like, you know, stomping game. Imagine, I mean, imagine, I mean you know, you go to Carnival or you go to Chuck E. Cheese, you have those spider stomping things, right? So that's what, you know, that's one of our game. So, you know, we lighten up in virtual reality, light up, you know, uh, bubbles in virtual space and ask them to stomp on it, right? The virtual lights. So it's a stomping game. So now, um, are they safe? Are they, you know, do they have full balance when they are stomping it, right? So maybe it's better for them to sit down and do it, right? So it's more about their stability and safety, especially in home. And another thing, we call it the cat problem. The cat problem is like when you are wearing a head-mounted display, you are shut off from the real world. Now, if you have a pet, if somebody comes nearby, now you are moving your hand, moving your legs in the real space, remember? <laughs> now you don't, you don't want to hurt somebody or somebody, you know, the cat coming in and you kick the cat and then the cat screams. You know, you don't want to go into those issues, right? So, um, so we prefer that people sit down and do it, but that's not a technological limitation. It's more about um, safety of the patient when they are, do it's like a workout, remember? It's like, it's like, we call it Excel game. It's exercise and gaming, right? It's an Excel game. And you are working out because, you know, you are using your knee. You know, we ask them to do it like 20 times, 30 times. So it's sometimes, you know, it's like a workout, right? So um, we don't want them to get hurt. So it's more about the safety. It's not a technological limit. I'm not asking this question. Um, you know, we um, also worry about virtual reality sickness or VR sickness, as we people call it, which is which is something that you experience when you are totally cut off from the virtual world, I mean, the real world, and you are totally in the virtual world and things are moving. Uh, so for that, we are we also have a, a different rendering for those people. We can simply see yourself on a TV. It's not fully immersive because it's not like, you know, wearing a headset where you like totally um, in that mixed reality scene, watching yourself. It's not like that because you're going to see everything around you and on, on TV, you are seeing yourself doing it. So it's not full, um, you know, immersion from a point of view of uh, immersive environment, but hey, mirror, I mean, it's better than the physical mirror still, right? So. Wow, this is incredible. So you did the pilot. Is it still in pilot stage or are you now fully immersed in this and what did you learn from the pilot so we had 10 uh, patients carrying out the study and um, this remember we had the pandemic in between so that put a pause on our studies and it and, and also remember it's a longitudinal study so if for every patient we need like three to four four weeks but it's not about three to four weeks it, it's actually much longer because the patient needs to be seen by the doctor, the doctor needs to see whether he or she is a good candidate for this type of treatment. Then they talk to the patient, right? Do you want to try out this, right? And some people say, no, just give me medication, right? We cannot force them to. Um, so once they buy in, then we show a demonstration and tell them, hey, now you are, are you comfortable, right? And then, you know, 
we do an assessment. I mean, I don't do it. My collaborators do an assessment in the clinic um, and then we give it to them for a week and then ask them to come back and tell us, are they still okay? And my students also offer, uh, my PhD students, research students working on this, they, they offer support in terms of, you know, any system issues or difficulties the patients might face. Um, so it's, it's, it's fairly a long process for one patient. So we did about 10 patients. We collected a lot of feedback and we are working on uh, a 2.0 version and also trying to reach out to part, you know, people who might be interested in licensing it or using it as a treatment option, right? So the, the 2.0 would be about handling these pet issues and giving some alerts when there are, you know, something happening in your surrounding so that you don't panic and do something that would uh, compromise the safety. So several improvements are happening and we are still working on the 2.0. At the same time, we are trying to see um, if we can find some interest in people who are interested in licensing it or deploying it for clinical trials. So we had a uh, provisional fa- patent filed last year. So we have to follow up with an actual patent this year sometime. So that's where we are now. So you kind of you kind of answered my question. So you're working on 2.0. What's next? Like beyond, what do you see Mr. Map doing beyond version 2.0? Have you guys thought that far? So um, I had to step back and give you a little bit of history about Veterans Affairs and where my collaborator was working. He moved to Penn State now. Um, and, but um, Veterans Affairs VA has an innovation wing. They, I don't know, I don't remember when they started it, but they are looking at some of these innovative research that are happening in VA and we, with VA collaborators and things like that. So um, my collaborator and myself participated in um, a boot camp type of thing for those innovators. And um, you know, my collaborator actually interviewed lots of uh, amputees. He in- interviewed um, healthcare providers and caregivers to understand like what they need and things like that. And based on that, we are working on 2.0. Uh, obviously, we need some funding <laughs> to to complete that 2.0 uh, because research in America, you know, cannot be done without funding. So uh, we, we are looking for funding uh, to complete 2.0, um, com- get that paid in and, and um, uh, go for more expanded clinical trial. Remember, it was a pilot trial. It just started with 10 patients. We didn't, we didn't do a study, well, they, what they call as randomized control, um, uh, clin- randomized clinical trial, where they compare it with placebo or compare it with other type of treatments, right? So um, we have not done that. So we need a lot more resources. We need access to a lot more patients to do such a type of study. So the 2.0 will be from the point of view of technology, but from the point of view of clinical trials, we need to go to randomized clinical trials or RCTs as they are called, where we will be comparing with the, the mirror box therapy or a placebo to, uh, or maybe both, to see how our Mr. Map um, performs, right? Or helps those amputees better. And then, so it's, it's a long road, but, uh, uh, we are happy that we are on the road. Yeah. So licensing would would probably help with funding a little bit, right? If you're licensing okay, out yeah. the technology. Yeah. Right. Right. Hopefully. Well, that's incredible. Great. Great job on all of this. And and I think the management of phantom pain is something that obviously our entire profession and the people that our profession serve need. So thank you for all of the amazing work that you're doing. Um, I think you're really going to make a, a big impact and we really appreciate you. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add that uh, we didn't have in our in our questions that you think our listeners may want to learn? So, the yeah, that's an interesting tag that you put in. Um, so uh, for obvious reasons, you didn't have it in your question. Uh, uh, it's the technology may, may not be just for amputees. It could be for stroke patients or you know, other type of other type of uh, problems that people might be having, right? So again, um, during the stakeholder interviews, as we call it, right? During the, the innovation bootcamp, uh, uh, you know, my 
collaborator and I interviewed a um, lot of people, right? And this is what we figured out that it may not be just for amputees. It could be for other type of uh, you know, issues people might be having, you know. So from, uh, from the point of your stroke patients, maybe it might help them uh, recover faster when the brain thinks that you can do this, right? Like, you know, imagine a stroke patient having a problem with the left hand and you put them in the mirror, uh, you know, the, the, the virtual environment where the left hand is really working, maybe the brain would stay out. It's working. Let me put in more effort, right? And maybe they get, um, you know, they recover faster, right? So, which is not tested so far. That's so. It's a very kind of like a high level wishful thinking or hypothesis, as we call it. Um, but those things, you know, some of exploring those um, type of uh, issues faced um, faced by the patients would be another thing that we would try. Excellent, Brendan. Do you have anything else? No, I, I'm fascinated. This was a, a wonderful interview, and I thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. For our listeners, if you would like to learn more, um, you can follow the link in our show notes. Well, there you have it. Thank you for listening to the ONP Check-In, an SPS podcast. If you like what you hear, hit the subscribe button on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Please rate and review the show to help fellow ONP professionals find us. We'd also like to hear from you directly. What topics do you want us to cover? Do you have any burning questions? Email us with your thoughts and feedback at SPSpodcast at SPSCO.com. See you next time. Bye. Bye.